Well, our most recent uh, USCCB general meeting ended with a morning of prayer, wonderful morning of prayer with benediction and, and morning prayer and so on. But at the heart of it was a um, sermon given by Archbishop Peter Sarton of uh, Seattle, who's been uh, a great leader of the church and, and a friend for some years. And uh, he and I have a, both have a great devotion to uh, Pier Giorgio Frassati, a wonderful Italian saint from the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, he talked about him. But you know what really struck me in his wonderful sermon was a reference to the great Catherine of Siena. And uh, as you know, one of the most remarkable features of this remarkable woman's life was her real intimacy with so many of the heavenly figures. You know, she had this, this intense personal dialogue, conversation with the Blessed Mother, with the saints, and with the Lord himself. And uh, Archbishop relayed a story that um, uh, her spiritual director, Raymond of Capua, told that she'd be reciting the office and walking you know, up and down a cloister, but she was reciting it in, in communion with Jesus, who was mystically visible to her. And they would exchange the psalms the way you do in a choir. And when she'd come to the end of the psalm, as is a liturgical custom, she'd recite the glory be, but here's how she would do it. She'd say, glory be to the Father, and to Thee, and to the Holy Spirit, because she was speaking directly to Jesus. Um, prayer was not something abstract for her. She was not in trying to commune with some distant power. It was a very intimate, personal conversation. And Archbishop Sarton invited us to reflect a bit on her use of the word the. Now it's interesting. In her Latin, she would have said Gloria Patri et Tibi and to you, but she was using the more familiar form, the more intimate form. So you know, in a lot of languages, uh, Latin included, the second person personal pronoun um, has both a formal and an informal uh, mode. You know, you can say you formally to someone you've just met or with whom you have a distant relationship, or you can say you in a more intimate way. Like you know, du versus z in German, you know, or uh, tu versus vu in French, etc. Um, and what he asked us to see was, the in English, in older English, is that intimate form of the second person uh, pronoun. Even though in the odd way that English is developed, at least spoken English, we tend to think of like thee and thou and thine and thy as being very formal and kind of regal, but in fact it's just the opposite that you and yours, that was the more formal version, but thee and thou and thy, that's the more intimate, the way you'd speak to a child or to a friend or someone that you were close to. And then he said, remember, in our prayers we can serve this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And the Hail Mary, right? Hail Mary full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. So the art thou, that's the, that's the familiar form. How wonderful that in our most exalted prayers, we invoke God in this and the Blessed Mother in this deeply personal way. Well, this is not just a curiosity. This is revealing something of great moment about Christianity. Contrasted, for example, to um, philosophies and mysticisms of the ancient world. Uh, Platonism comes to mind, uh, Plotinianism, Gnosticism. All those systems would speak of, of the divine, of some great uh, ontological source, some high mystical principle of all things, but you never dream of addressing that power with the intimate form. You never say thou to that um, source or that power. And of course the ancient uh, uh, philosophies have an echo in more contemporary uh, thought. So go back to um, the deism that was so popular in the 18th century that influenced our founding fathers. They talk about you know a first principle of the universe. Or think of um, the pantheist mysticisms of Friedrich Schleiermacher and, and uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson in the 19th century. And they, of course, have an echo in the New Age spiritualities of our own time. Again, all those talk about the divine or the sacred, some mystical source, but you'd be hard-pressed in a Schleiermacherian or Emersonian or New Age perspective to address this power as thou. And then there's the Bible. Then there's the Bible. Don't tell me, for example, 
that the Bible is just one more iteration of the monomyth, or the Bible's one more version of the universal religious story. It is not. The Bible knows all about God's transcendence. It knows all about the sort of awful, uncontrollable, inscrutable power of the creator of the universe. So the, the Bible has is, is no um, ignorance of, of those great mystical heights. But at the same time, the Bible says that God is a person who has created us individually, who loves us personally, who guides us, and who draws us ultimately into his own life. You will not find that in Plato. You will not find that in Plotinus. You will not find that in Emerson or Schleiermacher or the New Age. Keep pressing it. The Bible then speaks of this personal God who pitches his tent among us. That's St. John's beautiful language, that the word became flesh and dwelt, we say. But the Hebrew or the Greek has uh, the sense of pitching his tent among us. God becomes one of us in such a remarkable fashion that in Jesus he says, I no longer call you slaves, but friends. Now see, I mean, let that sink in, the, the peculiarity of biblical Christianity the peculiarity of biblical Christianity, that God, the high God, the creator of heaven and earth, the, the inscrutable, uncontrollable, ineffable, transcendent mystery of God, calls us friends so that we can respond to him as thou. See, there's a world of difference. And in fact, Christianity turns those other mysticisms on their, on their head. See, this matters so much, I think, for our contemporary concern for evangelization. What's evangelization? It's not just sharing ideas about Christianity, as important as that is. I'm an idea guy. I've spent my whole life teaching and writing, you know. But evangelization is the introduction of someone into a friendship with Jesus Christ, into a relationship with him. And as the old adage has it, nemo dot quad non habit, right? Nobody gives what he doesn't have. One of the reasons we don't evangelize effectively, I think, is a lot of even professed Christians don't walk personally with Jesus. And I'm not going to say, oh, that's something that's, that's just, you know, kind of a born-again Christianity thing. That's Christianity, simply, you know, that we walk personally with Christ. Once you do that, once you address him with the word thou, once you know that you have a friendship with the Lord, then you're able to share it. And that's what real evangelization is all about. Mm -hmm.